today we're reopening Trump's cabinet to take a second look at Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Azar. Because who would have guessed that when you leave one guy in charge of a department that handles all of health and human stuff, well, he's probably going to have to multitask. The issue we're focusing on today is prescription drug costs. Because... So the president has promised that he's going to put American patients first and drive down the prescription drug costs in the United States. And what he's going to be laying out this afternoon will be the most comprehensive plan to attack prescription drug price affordability of any president in history. Potential side effects may include drug price stocks increasing, disillusionment, and an existential crisis as to whether anyone can actually solve this problem. So go to your local math nerd and ask if Trump's plan is right for you. So first, what is the plan? Well, conveniently enough, this biggest plan in presidential history was summed up in one of the simplest government documents I've seen in a while. It's formatted like a guy who was trying to make a one-page document 44 pages. American Patients First, and it features a picture of a woman looking so happy to be talking to her pharmacist, I can only assume she's being told she shouldn't have taken all of the Vicodin at once. This plan has some good ideas in it, focused mostly on four ideas. Take it away, PBS. His plan aims to improve competition for drugs, in part by speeding generic drugs to market, give Medicare-approved insurance plans more power to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies over the prices of just some drugs, use trade deals to force other countries to pay for drugs they buy from the U.S. with the hope that it would lower would lead to lower costs here, and potentially require drug makers to disclose their list prices as part of advertising. Oh, I know I'm nerdy because I want to skip right to the Medicare one first. Because Medicare is really weird, in a good way. Briefly, Medicare is the old people medicine, and Medicaid is the poor people medicine. Now that we have that out of the way, Medicare seems like the best free market solution to this problem. Because it's able to negotiate prices. Geez, what an idea. Well, I mean, I figured that one out almost as soon as I could talk, but hey, it takes government a little longer. Now that I have your attention, let's dig a little deeper because I'm going to throw up a graph that's going to make anybody who cares about government efficiency, or just money in general, very happy. So you're telling me that the government is under budget in how much it spends on elderly people's medicine? And not just under budget almost half the predicted cost. I mean, think about how many countries we could invade with those kinds of savings. Turns out that the US has a lot of aging people, and aging people take a lot of pills. So you're gonna wanna negotiate with this group. Now, this negotiating only covers prescriptions in a Part D of Medicaid, which are drugs you can pick up at the local store. So why not get some other parts in, you know, part B, part C, and then celebrate with a part A. <laughs> Sorry. Well... And then take this whole other segment, part B, which is the drugs that you would get that your physician administers when you're in the physician's office. For the first time in history, negotiate and use the power of Medicare to negotiate discounts in part B. So actually, this is bigger and broader than anything that's ever been proposed before uh, in Medicare, using the full power of Medicare to negotiate against pharma companies. Great. Now part B and D are cheap. What about A and C? Well, those two revolve around hospice care, and if you want to negotiate down the price of nurses, well, in that case, you might actually get what you pay for. Unfortunately, none of this applies to me, though, because I wasn't old enough to have liked Ike. Now, some of you might look and say, hmm, is that quasi-single-payer portion of Medicare system saving the government money and being expanded by Trump? Well, yes, but don't worry. I'm not going to get on a soapbox. That's not what this episode's about. Next, we're working in conjunction with the Department of Commerce, the U.S. Trade Representative, and the U.S. Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator to develop the knowledge base necessary to address the unfair disparity between the drug prices in America and other developed countries. Yeah, you know, American patents first. Mm, sorry, patients first. What a solution. Sir, the U.S. spends more than any other country per capita on healthcare. Well, we have to change that. Have you tried charging everyone else more? If you think I'm exaggerating it, any- He effectively said, look, you know, you can go out and buy the exact same pill 
in Europe. Same exact thing, and it's going to cost you a few dollars. Whereas here in the United States of America, it's costing you hundreds of dollars. So why is that? How is that? And how do we fix that? Because why should the U.S. be subsidizing effectively the rest of the world? Now, before we keep going, this plan was written in early May, at a time when trade with America was not yet considered a liability. So why are we subsidizing other countries? Now, I know it sounds like I'm setting up this idea to be slammed down, but theoretically they have a point. Craig Garthwaite, a professor at Kellogg School of Management who studies drug prices, says, Think about a venture capitalist who is deciding whether to invest $10 million in a social media app or a cure for pancreatic cancer. As you decrease the potential profits I'm going to make from pancreatic cures, I'm going to shift more of my investment over to apps or just keep the money in the bank and earn the money I make there. It's a weird balance because if you want private investment in medicine, there have to be profits involved. But if you're like the US right now, with great medical technology that absolutely no one can afford, well, that's not really great either. What they would argue is that we are disproportionately distributing the costs of research onto US consumers. So now did it get this way? Well, most governments deal with healthcare by Instead of every private insurance company negotiating with every healthcare provider, there's just this big list. The country, the central government, they go and they say, if you want to sell to us, to all of our people, then here's what you can charge for a checkup. Here's what you can charge for an MRI or a prescription for Lipitor. Yeah, most countries have what would essentially be Medicare for all, which allows them to negotiate these cheap prices. This doesn't really address the question though, are they free riding? Well, I wouldn't say free riding as much as, you know how Trump thinks the rest of the world is laughing at us when it comes to climate change and trade negotiation? Well, if he described our healthcare system that way, he'd probably be right. So how do we convince other countries to spend more on healthcare? It is true that by paying more, we are making healthcare a more viable and valuable investment. But it's kind of like an entire nation deciding to pay floor price for cars because they're worried about a lack of innovation in the automobile industry. So how would the US lower their prices? Well, negotiate with their negotiators on behalf of pharmaceutical negotiators. Because the EU now just loves seeing US trade negotiators coming. Hey, we could start a second European trade war on top of the first one. Well, that would give me another month of content, so I'm in. The next thing that this bill would do is... We fundamentally believe that as a citizen, when you're watching a TV ad that is trying to entice you to go to your doctor's office and ask that doctor for a drug, that you are owed as a part of fair balance information to know how much that drug costs. Yeah, this one's just funny, but it was a pretty big part of this proposal. This would be a windfall for your average guy who walks into his doctor's office and says, I know you went to medical school for half your life, but a real person on my TV told me to, you know, just let you know that this drug's on the market and you should prescribe it to me. Cost? Eh, I'm not sure. But you know what? Let's go live a little and just do it. I mean, overall this is fine, but no one's expecting any world changing results there. I just wanted to riff a little bit. Although, just listen to his testimony about whether a czar will need support for this. To require drug companies to disclose prices in direct-to-consumer ads, don't you need Congress to give you this authority? So it would certainly, I would always appreciate congressional authority to back me up on that because I undoubtedly will be sued. I've never heard someone being so comfortable with being sued. Lawsuit? Pfft, Wednesdays. Congressional support would be helpful, so ask your congressman if this act is right for you. There's no way this could be construed as a not pro-consumer move, so good on you. The next part of this legislation is, you know how when you go to the grocery store you can either buy cola or Safeway brand cola that's spelled with a K that's a buck cheaper? Well, the same thing's true of prescription drugs. Increasing competition, more branded, generic, biosimilar competition to get cheap, competitive, affordable drugs out there for people. When the patent inspires on a drug, a ton of generics come onto the market. Yeah, you've got all the rich, cool kids with their branded drugs. Ooh, that guy's so cool he uses Lipitor to lower his cholesterol. Well, the rest of us are using Lovestin. 
These generic drugs are significantly more affordable than branded drugs, so once they come out, people can actually afford the wonderful technologies we've created. The problem? Today, a generic manufacturer that has been awarded 180 day exclusivity for being the first generic drug to file can park its application with the FDA, preventing additional generic manufacturers from entering the market indefinitely. Well, that makes absolutely no sense. Those generics are starting to sound pretty specific if you ask me. According to the Health and Human Services 2019 budget, great title page by the way. Maybe our title page is missing something. Like a title. Eh, it's the 2019 Health and Human Services budget. No one's reading that. Well, I did. And according to that budget, the proposal makes the tentative approval of a subsequent generic drug application approximately 10 hours later. A trigger of that first applicant's 180 day exclusive. You got all that? Allow me to translate into non-lawyer speak. Basically, if you hold a generic exclusivity agreement, that 180 days is triggered the first time you try to use it to block someone else from making the drug, which would allow more generics to enter the market once the patent has expired. So four months later, how has this plan worked? To the top 10 drug manufacturers to see how many had lowered prices in response to the blueprint. And all 10 of them have now responded. Zero out of 10 said that they had lowered any prices. Zero out of 10 gave any indication that they planned to do so. And in fact, one out of 10 said prices are going to go up later this year. Yeah, I've emailed enough companies to know that zero of them responded saying they're lowering prices because they all sent back a forum letter. Sir, the entire management team has gone on vacation for the foreseeable future. Don't email us. We'll get back to you when we get back. Some of you might hear that as a failure, but are you serious? Only one drug company is raising prices? I mean, that's crazy. Although a week ago, it was reported. Remember when Donald Trump promised drug prices would come down? Drug makers didn't appear to get that memo, with a number of companies raising prices on their medicines to kick off the second half of the year. It was less than two months ago that Trump unveiled his blueprint to lower drug prices. You may recall biotech and pharma stocks jumped that day as the plan appeared to have less bite than many feared, and then have since continued to appreciate. The most recent thing we have was Donald Trump doing what he does best and releasing a targeted tweet storm against pharmaceuticals because of that industry industry-wide price hike. Pfizer and others should be ashamed that they have raised drug prices for no reason. They're merely taking advantage of the poor and others unable to defend themselves, while at the same time giving bargain basement prices to other countries in Europe and elsewhere. We will respond. And respond he did, by getting on the phone with Pfizer and convincing him to delay a price hike. Not sure how long that delay will last. We'll see if it goes into effect maybe the day after the midterm, or if Trump managed to art of the deal his way into a 2020 price hike. Anyways, prices aren't going down, although as long as we can get the president to continue to make personal calls to every pharmaceutical giant every time they want to raise prices, we could maintain prescription drug prices the way they are. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating Trump's cabinet, subscribe to our YouTube channel for our weekly episodes. As always, thank you for watching.